I would add this scripture for our reflection today before we begin the message from Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is among people. She will dwell with them, and they will be her people. And God herself will be with them as their God. She will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. Let us pray. O oh, loving and gracious God, we do again give you thanks for bringing us together today. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be pleasing and acceptable unto thee, O oh God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. For three weeks now, our scripture lessons have placed us in the heart and mind of the Apostle Paul as conveyed in a letter to his co-worker, Timothy, clearly a mover and shaker in the church in Ephesus, a wealthy and highly influential Roman port city in the province of Asia. As noted in earlier sermons, Paul is consumed by the notion of godliness as well as the preaching of false teachers. Paul not only wants Timothy and other Ephesian Christians to be aware of the false teachers, he wants to remind them that the mark of a true believer in Christ is a transformed life. The old hymn comes to mind, they will know we are Christians by our love. And yet that's what it boils down to in Paul's thinking. One cannot claim the Christian faith cannot claim to be firmly in the grip of Christ unless her life has been transformed and changed from the inside out. Lots of folks, of course, then and now make a claim on faith. Countless numbers of people across the centuries have professed with their lips to be followers of Jesus the Christ. Paul doesn't give a hoot about what people say. Paul is interested in how people live, how they live out the faith that they proclaim with their lips. What he's talking about, though, isn't works righteousness. Please don't misconstrue what he's talking about with works righteousness, that one can earn her way into heaven. No, the apostle Paul is saying with all of his heart and believes with all of his heart, that salvation is solely the result of God's unmerited, free, and wasteful grace. What he's talking about here, what he's insisting upon here, is that one's life, how one navigates in the real world, how one engages in the real world, how one lives in the real world, must be compatible with one's profession of faith. The writer of the book of James put it this way, faith without works is dead. Again, not works righteousness, no earning our way to heaven. Instead, simply, profoundly, the alignment of our words and our deeds. From today's lesson, Paul's caution to be godly and content. A reminder to one and all that we bring nothing into the world. Therefore, we should be careful not to take too much from the world. A warning for those who wish to be rich that they carefully guard against senseless and harmful desires that might plunge them into ruin and self-destruction to avoid being haughty to pursue right living, to pursue righteousness, to love, 
to be gentle, to be good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, said things allowing us to take hold of the life that really is life, which in turn might very well lead us closer and closer to a world that all of us, that all of us can believe in. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. If Paul's first letter to Timothy is a bit too practical for you today, if what your soul needs this morning is what your rich imagination craves, a healthy measure of, of something that's a bit more captivating than the practicality of Paul, then the vision of a new world that all of us can believe in is also found in the book of Revelation chapter 21. The book of Revelation, of course, is thought of, is interpreted in myriad ways. Some interpret Revelation as a broad view of history. Some say it's referring to the events of the apostolic era, to the events of the first century or at the latest, to the fall of the Roman Empire, a rather restrictive view of history. Some believe that Revelation describes future events, what some call the end times, and some believe that it's allegory, allegory of the spiritual path and the ongoing struggle between good and evil. Some believe that Revelation is rubbish. 19th century agnostic Robert Ingersoll called Revelation the insanest of all books. Thomas Jefferson omitted Revelation from the Jefferson Bible, writing at one time that he considered it as merely the ravings of a maniac. Whatever Revelation is, and whatever you believe it to be, from its obscure and extravagant imagery comes a question from the 21st chapter that's worthy of our time and consideration this morning, and that is congruent with today's lesson from 1 Timothy. And the question is this, is a new world, a world that all of us can believe in, possible? A quick glance at the newspaper, a quick listen to cable news, events at home and abroad, so much that's going on in America and in the world today call into question the probability that a world we can all believe in is possible. There are significant ideological struggles, the vying for power, violence of all kinds, war and the threat of war, callousness, the loss of life. All of these things run rampant throughout human history they're running rampant in America and in the world today. Even Jesus himself offered a gloomy assessment long ago of the human condition when he said matter-of-factly in the Gospel of John that you will always have the poor among you. Yes, it's hard for some of us to believe that a new world, that a world that all of us can believe in is possible. The old world, the way things have seemingly always been, the cynic, the skeptic, the, the realist often proclaims, this is how things will always be. The writer of Revelation finds himself squarely in a world that has always been. If some biblical commentators are correct, John of Patmos, the self-identified author of Revelation, knew firsthand the excess of human power manifest in the Roman Empire. He's on the island of Patmos because he's been banished there by Roman authorities, maybe by the emperor himself. Like the Apostle Paul, John, John of Patmos knew what it was like to endure the wrath of Rome. 
He's there, perhaps, for being a Christian. Maybe he wouldn't participate in emperor worship, and so instead of being put to death, he was simply banished, driven from society, isolated so that his words, so that his resistance would have no effect on the people. He's there perhaps because he was a radical street preacher, one of those crazy street preachers that you and I see from time to time on the streets of our city on the streets of major cities across the country, a street preacher calling out the sins of Roman life, intolerance, injustice, selfishness, greed, violence, and a slave trade. He's there, perhaps, because he was simply an annoyance, a constant daily presence and reminder that all wasn't well in the empire, wasn't well in the heart and soul of the empire's leader and people, that Rome wasn't, in fact, a shining city on a hill. If the Apostle Paul and John of Potmos could stand on our street corners today, I'm guessing that they would have much to say about our world and its people. I'm guessing they would have much to say about the enormous chasm between the rich and the poor. That they would gaze upon some 200,000 slums and shanty towns across the world. Slums and shanty towns, home to millions and millions of people. The top five in places like Mexico City, Mexico, Karachi, Pakistan, Mumbai, India, Cape Town, South Africa, and Nairobi, Kenya. They would gaze upon the slums and the shanty towns found in most capitals of European countries. That they would gaze upon some of our large cities and they would see the slums and the shanty towns. The disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And they would wonder. I'm guessing they would have much to say about a world family that produces more than enough food to feed all of its people. To feed all the people of the world, over 7 billion people. And in spite of that fact... That every single day, 25,000 people die of hunger or hunger-related illness. Sadly, one person every three and a half seconds. One, two, three, dead. 1,200 people will die before we finish our worship service today. Even while we have enough food in the world to feed all of its people. I'm guessing they would have much to say about human trafficking. That every year that in almost every country in the world that thousands of men, women, and children fall into the hands of human traffickers. That thousands of people are used as prostitutes as forced laborers, as slaves, as servants, that thousands of people are being used for the harvesting of human organs. I'm guessing they would have much to say about our neglect and abuse of the earth. How poorly we have acted as stewards of God's creation. I'm guessing they would have much to say about the blatant disregard for human life in acts of war and the lack of medical care in gang violence and hate crimes. I'm guessing they would have much to say about our ridiculous bickering, our ridiculous name-calling, our petty complaints and criticisms. That they would have much to say about how we tear one another down instead of how we build one another up. 
I'm guessing they would have much to say about cowardly and senseless acts of terror imposed on innocent civilians by those wielding assault weapons, weapons of mass destruction. And I'm guessing they would look around and they would understand why so many doubt the possibility of a new world, a world that all of us can believe in. And yet I'm guessing that they would help us to catch a glimpse of a transformed world. A transformed world made possible by transformed lives. A new heaven and a new earth. That holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Where the writer of Revelation says every tear will be wiped dry, where, where mourning and crying and pain will be no more, where all things will somehow be made new. You see, I think Paul and John of Potmos firmly believed that good would prevail over evil, evil of every kind, that our very best selves would somehow come forward that a new world, that a world that all of us can believe in, is possible. I think in spite of the personal hardship and loss that they knew, in spite of the dire situations that they knew, in spite of what Rome did to them, they knew. They believed in the triumph of transformed lives and a transformed world, not mediocrity and not the status quo. I think they believed that justice would prevail over injustice, tolerance over intolerance, care over benign neglect, and love over hate. I think they knew that they felt in their bones that a different world, that a new world, that a world that all of us can believe in was possible. But only when the people recognized that God was in their midst, that God was calling them to newness of life, to godliness, to a new way of being in relationship with each other and with all of creation, only when ordinary people allowed their higher selves, the better angels of their nature, the Christ consciousness, if you will, to be that which guided their thoughts and their words and their deeds. I think they truly believed in a new world, in a world that all of us here today can believe in, if ordinary people like you and me made it so. One word, one act of kindness, one act of tolerance or inclusion, the insistence on justice or fairness, one letter to an elected leader insisting on change, one march in the streets, one meal shared, one embrace, one conversation, one thought, one word, one deed at a time, and a new world, a world that all of us can believe in, is possible. My dear friends, go out this week and in your own way, do your part to bring in that world, that new, exciting world, a world that all of us can believe in. You can do it. You can do it. And you must do it. 
Amen.